Thank you. Today we are going to discuss the use of time as a resource that you can and indeed must learn to manage in our global economy and interconnected world. Last year I discussed in this forum the ways in which time is viewed in different ways in different countries and cultures and how that influences the way you work and manage, particularly when you work in cross-border teams or interact in other ways with people in other countries and cultures. Today, as the introduction suggested, we are going to focus on the importance of time to your ways of managing and conducting business in this global society. For many years, one of the most popular training and management development programs, particularly in the United States, has been one that teaches people how to effectively use and manage their time. This program usually has a title something like Time Management. In the United States, the effective and efficient use of one's time has been seen as an important skill in the achievement of one's personal and professional goals. Even so, as will be described in this presentation, the use of our time takes on new and even greater importance in this 24-hour society, and not just for people in the United States or in the other most developed countries. It has become important to people in all countries and cultures. Let me describe two sources of this new importance. First, your customers and suppliers, those people who invest in your business and your professional colleagues are all likely to be located these days in many different countries. You carry cell phones with you all the time and your phones and computers link you to all these people 24 hours a day. Are any of these things true for you? Do you sell to customers or buy from suppliers in other countries? Do individuals in other countries own part of your business? Do you have colleagues and friends in other countries? If so, it has become necessary that you learn to utilize your time in effective ways so that you can also have time left over for yourselves and for your families and friends. This 24-hour society has come about as a result of a number of different circumstances. Many firms have established subsidiary operations around the globe in every time zone through licensing and outsourcing to local firms around the world, by offshoring that is through the hiring of professional staff in other countries and through setting up service and call centers that have to be staffed 24 hours a day because customers and product users and clients are located around the world in every time zone and they seek service at all times of the day and night. In addition, most of you have professional contacts and colleagues with whom you interact on a regular basis who are our as likely to reside in our work in other countries as they are to be located in your own countries. As an example, in my own case, I maintain almost daily contact and work on projects with many colleagues who are located throughout the world. I regularly attend conferences with professional colleagues from around the globe, the most recent of which have been in Ireland and Hong Kong. Even the conference from which I just returned in New Orleans here in the United States had participants from 36 countries and they made up about one quarter of the total registration. Indeed, our personal and work lives have become quite international in pretty much every way conceivable. The consequence of this is that no matter where you are located and what time it is for you, even the middle of the night, there will be people with whom you interact, suppliers, customers, colleagues, and so on, who will be in the middle of their workday when it is the middle of your night and will want to interact with you right now. Globalization and global communication have created this 24-hour society, this 24-7 work week. And secondly, all of us in our globalized economies face increasing competition from firms that are located all over the world. No matter how small or large your organizations are or what your product or service is, you find yourselves competing with firms that you often have never heard of and which are based in many other countries. 
in order to succeed and to capture and retain customers, you have to stay ahead of these competitors. Even in my work as an educator and author, I need to consider global competition. For example, I just published a new book with a London publisher, that's London in the United Kingdom, and we were under strong pressure to complete this project quickly because the one competing book, interestingly written by two Australian authors and published by an American publisher, was also coming out at almost exactly the same time. There was a great advantage in publicity to the publisher and to us authors who would get their book out first. Thus, this form of time pressure, that is, the pressure of global competition, forces us to do everything quickly. Developing new products and services, delivering your products and services to your customers, and providing after-sales service must all be done with increasing levels of speed as quickly as possible in as little time as we can manage. In today's global economy, customers tend to seek the best quality and lowest price they can find, regardless of where they reside or the country of origin of the products or services they seek, and the speed of delivery or availability of these products is also one of the critical customer considerations. Global communication enables customers to be aware of the best and cheapest products and services and their availability. For today's global customers, national origin of products and services is not so important. Loyalty to brands and suppliers of products and services is often replaced by concern for quality and price. The point here in a presentation about time is that firms must pay increased attention to constant innovation and improvement so that they can deliver the best and cheapest products and services to their global customers as quickly as possible. This also requires that firms pay special attention to learning and knowledge management so that they can deliver improved products and services more quickly than their competitors. Managers must find the time to learn, both for themselves and their organizations, so that they can stay ahead of their global competitors. This global and 24-hour economy, therefore, requires a willingness to perform work, deliver products and services, on time or quickly. Because if you don't, someone else, your competitor, will. And you must also constantly upgrade and improve. That is, get better, faster than your competitors. Since, again, if you don't, your competitors will. As Andy Grove of Intel says, the only source of, sus of sustainable strategic advantage today is to learn and perform faster than your competitors. These realities make it absolutely necessary for organizations and their managers, meaning you and your organizations, in every country and culture, to manage your time effectively and efficiently. To summarize these introductory points, let me make the following comments. No matter what country or culture you come from, time is important. How you view it may differ from country to country. Your concerns and perspectives may have a much longer time horizon and may be much more focused on relationships than is the case in some other cultures and countries. And some of you may live in a culture that worries much less about the use of time than is the case in other cultures. Yet all of us in our globalized economies, which are characterized by increasing competition from around the globe with its constant pressure regarding costs and the need for continuous improvement, plus the need and desire by so many countries to participate in the global economy, all of us must focus on the importance of getting things done in a timely and speedy manner. If you don't respond quickly to the needs of your customers or accept new ideas and technology quickly, someone else, your competitors, will and will thus take away your customers and business. The rest of our time together today will be devoted 
to a discussion of how you can more effectively use your time in this 24-hour global society. And my hope is to provide this discussion in a way that is sensitive to the various cultural contexts within which each of you listeners lives. So, what should one do exactly to better manage his or her time in our new globalized and interconnected work situations? First, I think it is important for you to develop your own philosophy of time. By this, I mean establishing your own set of priorities related to your use of time. It is important to understand and realize that how you use your time is your own choice. It is easy to believe the pressures on your time is due to the demands of your bosses, your work, your career, your friends and family, your subordinates, and so on. But if work always gets priority over family or your own physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being, then it is your choice. And the consequences, such as stress or illness or difficult relationships, are also then basically your choice. A healthy philosophy of time, then, would suggest that the most important priorities in one's use of time should go to one's health and well-being. Of course, health and well-being are defined in different ways in different cultures. So first, decide for yourself, based on your own situation, what is most important to you. This will help you decide how to approach the many other suggestions that I want to present to you here, and will also often be a part of those suggestions themselves. Most of the rest of what I want to say falls into the category of working smarter, not harder. First and most important in your job is to decide what is most important to you in your job. This could include any number of activities and responsibilities, such as satisfying your customers, satisfying your boss, maintaining relationships with colleagues or subordinates, or enhancing your career. Sometimes these responsibilities complement each other and sometimes they're in conflict. But they always influence the number of hours per day that you work. If personal well-being, for example taking the time for regular exercise or healthy eating and outside relationships, such as time with your family and friends, is most important then the choices about how you use your time at work must be balanced by your desire to also have time and energy available for your personal needs. An important component of determining what is important to you is to establish priorities regarding your many activities and responsibilities. For example, you may decide that family and friends come first and that your professional career and development come second. As a result, your specific day-to-day -day work tasks should be managed within these first two priorities. Or maybe your career and current job come first and reserve, receive first priority in your use of time. In any case, you should develop specific goals for each of the areas of your life that you determine to be important. Otherwise, in your chaotic and complex lives, you are likely to find yourselves pursuing what I refer to as a scatter pattern of activity that will ultimately fail to ensure that you can satisfy any of your personal priorities. Second, and the focus of many of the rest of my remarks, is to teach you to manage your time. Think about how you use your time. In order to do this well, many authors and time management specialists suggests that it is important to keep some sort of diary in which to record your use of time. Only in this way can you be sure to develop an accurate understanding of what you do and how you really use your time. One of the key reasons for this is that experience and research shows that most people do not have an honest perception of how they actually use their time. That is, they kid themselves. 
They think they use their time more effectively and efficiently than they really do. So developing some way to keep accurate track of your use of time is a first step in finding ways to manage it. Determine periods and activities that you could label as wasting time. That is, they are activities that do not lead to your achieving any of your objectives, whether these objectives involve maintaining personal and business relationships or better serving your customers. The goal here is to minimize what are referred to as time robbers or time wasters. That is to minimize or eliminate those activities that detract from your ability to spend time on those tasks that you have determined are the most important. Efficiency and effectiveness are connected in our 24-hour workdays. To be effective, that is to deliver the highest quality, most innovative, and lowest cost products and services to your customers faster than your competitors, requires that you learn to make efficient use of your time. One major key for creating this efficiency is to eliminate those activities that get in the way of the use of your time for your most important objectives. Because of their importance, I want to spend a considerable amount of time describing the most common of these time wasters so as to help you identify time wasters in your own personal and professional lives and maybe thus help you be more effective in eliminating minimizing or otherwise managing them. One thing you might do first is to make a list of those items you are aware of or that you think could contribute to an ineffective use of your time. Researchers have found that when people from all over the world are asked to make such a list, that list typically includes the following time wasters. First, bad information or lack of information, which leads to bad decisions and having to redo tasks. Procrastination, so that you always end up under pressure to get things done on time. This often results in last minute problems, which then cause you to spend more time to get these tasks completed. Too much reading and too many things to read. This can lead to information overload, which takes up too much time to digest and understand your reading, and creates problems with trying to figure out what is most important. Too many meetings, or ineffective meetings, sometimes caused by hastily arranged meetings, or meetings with no agenda. Lack of competent personnel, which can stem from either bad hiring choices, or from basing those choices on poor selection procedures, or it can result from bad supervision and training of employees, so that extra time has to be spent on last-minute training and extensive explanation, or on having to do the work yourself. Failure to delegate and trying to do everything yourself, thus overloading yourself and not allowing your staff to be effective. Interruptions both people and telephone calls, which can make it difficult to focus on the task at hand and to wasting time as you have to figure out how to get back on track after every interruption. Junk mail, regular mail and email, which can take too much time to go through and to delete. Lack of procedures for routine matters, so that time is wasted over and over again deciding what to do and when to do it. Even poor physical fitness, which can lead to a lack of energy and both slow and ineffective decision making and inactions taken. Inability to say no, so that you take on too many activities and thus are always working under pressure. This can lead to having to spend too much time overall on what are often unimportant activities or often having to take time to perform tasks that should be performed by someone else. Some people even put socializing and beautiful secretaries on their list of time wasters. Now look at list A. In a recent training program on time management, 
participants were asked at the beginning of the program to make a list of their major time wasters. As can be seen on this list, many of the items are external to the individual. That is, the training program participants perceived initially that most of their time problems stemmed from issues external to themselves. That is, they could be blamed on someone else. Their time problems were not their fault. They were someone else's fault. This list includes items such as not being given adequate information for solving problems, having to spend too much time on the problems of their subordinates, having to do every everything themselves, that is, not being able to delegate responsibility to their employees, interruptions from people and the telephone, too many meetings, a lack of priorities and a lack of clarity of the goals as set from above, spending too much time on outside, that is, outside of work activities, and poor communication and mistakes, which require that time be spent correcting mistakes. Do any of those issues show up on your list of time wasters? Do they look reasonable? If so, how difficult would it be to limit their impact on you and your workday? After completing this list, the trainees were given some information about managing their time more effectively and shown a video. It was developed by a well-known management consultant that showed the life of an executive who, during the extent of his workday, experienced most of the common time wasters during his normal work routine. After being exposed to this additional knowledge, the training participants were asked to develop a new list of their perceived time robbers or time wasters. This second effort can be viewed in list B. Interestingly, and I think importantly, the participants were much more likely to place items on this second list that were more directly within their own control and within their own spheres of influence. This list included items such as trying to do too many things at the same time, making unrealistic estimates of how long it would take to get tasks completed. Does this sound familiar? It certainly is one of my major problems. And when combined with the next item on the list, becomes a major problem with my own use of time. Procrastination, or putting tasks off until it takes extra time to complete them on time. Lack of organization, so that time is wasted on trying to find information and reports and previously completed projects. Failure to listen well, so that time is wasted in working on the wrong project or doing the wrong things and having to redo assignments. For example, I just had a graduate level student turn in a final paper that did not fit the assignment. He admitted he had not looked carefully enough at the written expectations for the assignment. And now, after the deadline for the project, he has to redo the paper to better fit the assignment as stated for the course. Doing too many things themselves rather than delegating tasks and responsibilities to others. The inability to say no, and thus ending up doing too many things or doing things that should be completed by others spending too much time getting too many people involved, both in decision-making and in actually performing tasks, maybe when a single person or a limited number of people can and should be making the decisions and completing the tasks. Too many people can get in each other's ways and make it necessary to spend too much time getting de such decisions made and such tasks finished and making snap decisions that often lead to mistakes and the need to spend extra time cleaning up the messes that result. Spending too much time blaming others rather than taking responsibility for what is achieved or not achieved and when mistakes are made just getting on with correcting the mistakes. And spending too much time on personal and outside activities 
that conflict with achieving one's work responsibilities. These results reinforce what has been suggested earlier, that at the heart of time management is management of self. The rest of my suggestions today have also been shown to be as useful as the pinpointing of your time wasters. But whether you choose to apply these principles and techniques depends to a large degree on your personal philosophy of the relationships between your work, time, leisure, and relationships with family and friends. And all of these are interrelated. In another segment, we will talk about some techniques you can use to help you make the most of that precious resource, time. Thank you. Uh, let's begin with the uh, first question and answer session. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. Therefore, we ask that uh, only one question be asked per phone call and that these questions be as brief as possible. You may call the studio directly at the phone numbers or fax which appear on your screen. We remind you to make your phone calls at a distance from the monitor to avoid feedback. Uh, the first question is from the Habana, Cuba. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning to all the members of the uh, network. Our question is the following. This concept of the 24-hour society can then be explained because people actually uh, work more than the eight-hour workday or because people have more to do outside of their um, just work schedule. What would be the result of this? Why is this happening? Thank you very much. Ah, this is probably the question at the heart of the issue today. I think it's probably both. People are doing more. They're being asked to do more. Firms are downsizing. They're trying to do more with fewer people. So we all end up with more tasks and more chores. And probably on a personal level, we are also taking on uh, more, more things that we wish to try to do. But we're also, because of that, having to work longer hours just to get in uh, the time. The uh, studies show that the number of hours being worked, in many countries anyway, is uh, increasing. I think probably at the root of all of this, as I mentioned earlier, is technology. We have the ability, I don't know if that's the right word, you know, we walk around with technology and we're in front of technology that just keeps us connected uh, 24 hours a day. The cell phones, the computers, um, the, just the connections around the world. Okay. Uh, next question is from Quito, Ecuador. Go ahead, please. I'm calling from the um, Espiritu Santo University, and I would like to ask the following question. If I have a company, and I want all of the members of this company can have this time philosophy, the one that you've been speaking about. How can we achieve this, to have everybody under the same philosophy threshold, per se? Well, I, I guess the only answer I have to that is that it's a uh, problem of education. People need to be exposed to the ideas, whether that's reading manuals or uh, books or having a trainer come in and spend time with everybody going over the ideas. Uh, ultimately, I think the changes of whatever type are a problem of education. Okay, um, how does technology uh, work in this thing? Is, is technology making our lives easier or making it more complex? Well, let me, what I thought you were gonna ask was technology as it rates, relates to educating people. Okay. Obviously, Technology provides a way to get new ideas and new information to people without maybe having everybody sitting together in the same room. Um, and that probably helps bring these kinds of ideas to everybody within a, a company. But I suppose you know, we talk about technology simplifying our lives, but I think technology probably has as much a, a negative impact or a complex creation than it does uh, simplifying our lives. Great, thank you. We go to Chihuahua, Mexico for the next question. Go ahead, please. Buenos días. 
I would just like to ask the following. I believe that that there is a certain disparity here in what the doctor has um, expressed, because I think um, in order to take advantage of time, you have to delegate. But on the other hand, you're saying that we should not be involved with our subordinates' problems. And I believe that if we do not involve uh, on helping our subordinates to help their problems, then they will not be able to carry out efficiently the tasks that we ask them to do. And then the function of delegating um, does not meet its objective. So could you please expand on these two concepts? Because I think there are some um, a conflict here. Thank you. Uh, I guess I didn't intend to leave the impression that you don't get involved with the lives of your employees. Um, you don't want to what we would refer to as micromanage their time because that obviously then becomes a problem with your own use of time. But yes, it's, it's important as you empower your employees and delegate your employees to really care about your employees and the difficulties that they experience. Uh, I think one of the reasons for helping them understand how to use their time is that it helps both of you. It helps them with balance in their lives and it helps you, the, the manager or supervisor, uh, do your job better as well. Thank you. I guess I believe our next question is also from Mexico. Go ahead, please. My comment is regarding how much um, currently have you seen in this globalized era where we can actually communicate in real time, especially in financial institutions, and how has this had an effect in the administration of time? And on the other hand, how can we implement this in Latin American countries where uh, we don't have or give a tangible valuable to time. Thank you. Uh, this is the topic that I dealt with last year, and it obviously uh, is one of the complexities of time. When you deal with people in other countries, and as you just suggested, financial institutions and uh, others have to work 24 hours a day when they're dealing with correspondent banks and other organizations that they interact with in other countries. They may well have operations in every time zone in the world, so it becomes an, a 24-hour-a-day operation. One of the things I noticed, for instance, in Spain, and would be true also for Latin American countries, um, banks, because of their international operations, need to stay open all hours. Uh, so the traditional time off in the afternoon, for instance, uh, becomes impossible. So this new globalization and technology is, make, is forcing uh, new ideas about time on companies. Great, thank you. The next question uh, is from Lima, Peru. Go ahead, please. This is Felipe Salazar from the University of Ricardo Palma in Lima, Peru. And my question is, how can we manage our times in relation with other people? That is, how can we establish priorities so that we can maximize our time and we can achieve our own objectives through other people, that is, with our own community in general? Uh, thank you for the question because it's a good lead in to the second half of the presentation. Uh, I deal directly with some of those kinds of issues in the uh, coming session. So um, I, I don't want to put that question off. Uh, wh there are a number of things that we can do to segment our use of time, for instance. I understand that relationships are very important. And I think one has to just decide that if those are important, we literally plan time for our relationships. Thank you for your questions. Uh, let's now move to the second module of our program.